It is my honor this morning to introduce our speaker and dear sister in Christ. Emanuela Medina is a native of the Philippines. She is a parishioner of Corpus Christi Parish in Stone Mountain. The Holy Spirit has been at work in Emanuela throughout her life, and she in turn has led many to the Holy Spirit. She will speak of how she fell in love with the Lord and her realization that there is more that God longs to pour out on those living the Christian life. This is the day the Lord has made, isn't it? Praise God. Yeah. Let us rejoice and be glad. Amen. It's not by chance that you are here in this room today, this morning. God has a plan for you, and there's more if you're open to what God has in store for you. So it's a blessing to be here with the gathering of women. It really is a ministry to women. And it's such a joy that you have responded to this because we want this room may be full next time. <laughs> or maybe you can have a stadium for that because you know what? Women have an important role to play in the church. In our time, if you believe that, I do believe that. <laughs> well, somebody said, count your blessings, name them one by one, and you will be surprised what the Lord has done. And let me do that counting, and let me do that boasting, because he said, whoever boasts, boasts in the Lord. And so, this is part of my faith journey that I would like to share with you this morning. And um, just you know, fasten your seatbelts. <laughs> okay. June 21st, 1981, Manila International Airport, Philippines. I was one of the many passengers on board Northwest Airlines bound for the United States waiting for the plane to take off. It was to be my first international flight to a country I have heard so much about and thought of leaving someday. Now that it's getting close to reality, I felt nostalgic leaving the country that has been home to me and my family. Leaving the country that holds so many wonderful memories of God's loving divine providence was not easy. It was the land of our birth where we all grew up, where the seed of faith was planted in our hearts, grew, nurtured by grace through all the years. How can I ever thank God for the gift of life and not remember the incident surrounding my birth on that first day of January, 66 years ago, when I was almost lost to my parents? As told to me years later, a premature rupture of the amniotic sac and delayed delivery had compromised my survival so that I was considered a stillbirth. After several unsuccessful attempts to revive me, I was put aside, given up for dead. I was told that my grandmother refused to give up, resuscitated me, and literally breathed life into me. The baby is alive, gracias Dios, could be heard amidst the shouts of joy. It was a great joy to my parents that I am alive after suffering two miscarriages. Genesis 2 verse 7 reads, The Lord formed man out of the clay of ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and so man became a living being. These words of scriptures has become literally meaningful to me. Not long after that miraculous intervention, I was baptized by the Paris priest who chose my name, Emanuela, saying God was surely with this family. Today, I stand before you, alive and well, so blessed and graced by God. I'm reminded of these words from scriptures. You formed my inmost being. You knit me in my mother's womb. I praise you so fearfully and wonderfully you made me. Wonderful are your works. My very self you knew. 
my bones were not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, fashioned as in the depths of the earth, your eyes foresaw my actions. In your book, all were written down. My days were shaped before it came to be. These words and the incidents surrounding my birth gives me the conviction that life is sacred, a precious gift from God, and that we are not mere accidents or here simply by chance as we may first believe. Rather, God created each one of us with a purpose and with a unique plan for our lives. He loves each one of us as his own. He says, I have called you by name. You are mine. We are beloved sons and daughters of God. When we struggle of knowing of who we are, it is important to remember of our true identity and make it our own. That I am a beloved child of God. I am God's beloved. I am the eldest of eight children born in the island province of the Philippines off the north coast of Mindanao. When I was about two years old, my parents left for the city of Manila to pursue college education. After earning college degrees, my parents moved the family far from the influence of city life to a small town reachable only by boat, about five hour travel time from Manila, the capital city. It was here where the rest of seven siblings were born and where eight of us, including myself, grew up. One thing I remember about living in this small town was the custom where everybody used to stop and pose for silent prayer. Every time the church bells rings at noon and at six in the evening for the angelus, whether it be at home or on the road, where men teeth off their hats when passing by the church, where young and old would bow their heads in recognition of the God living inside the church. Ours was a simple upbringing, with everything we did grounded in our family, our church, and our community. Our parents instilled in us at a young age faith and trust in God, love of God and neighbor, godly principles which shaped and guided our lives individually and as a family. A family that prays together, stays together. Praying the rosary was part of everyday life in the family, a devotion to our Blessed Mother that continues to this day. On Sundays, the Medinas can be seen, fill up a church pew as the family continued to grow in numbers through the years. Mother Superior used to say, or to remind dad and mom, don't worry, Mr. and Mrs. Medina, trust in God. God will provide. These children are the gifts from God. These are the gifts of the Holy Spirit when we were seven. And when we became eight, these are the Beatitudes. <laughs> I just wonder what would nine be? Yes, the wisdom of the nuns with their sense of humor. My parents were consummate educators, committed to excellence, strong values, discipline, and accountability. This passion and commitment ensure that all eight children were all sent to private schools from grammar all the way to collegiate education. The girls were under the educational tutelage of the Holy Spirit sisters, while the boys were under the SVDs, the Society of Divine Word Missionaries. Constantly inculcated in our minds is the irreplaceable value of education. Dad and mom always reminded us that we are not rich and that there's no better inheritance that they can give us but our education. That once you have it, no one can steal it away from you. Our grandmother shared the same passion. In spite of her meager means, she celebrated our graduation by taking money from the small coins she saved 
for years so that we can have our pictures taken in our cups and gowns and to memorialize the dream for us. Eventually, my sister's desire to grow in her nursing career brought her to the United States. After finishing college with a degree in education, my first teaching job was with the Holy Spirit Sisters, also known as the Missionary Sister Servants of the Holy Spirit. May the Holy Triune God live in our hearts and the hearts of all people, the school motto ingrained in our minds. Later, I would come to know that we as children of God are to live our Christian life and witness in communion with the Triune God, the Blessed Trinity, in the diversity of culture and nationalities we are called to serve, in the dynamism of the Holy Spirit. My next teaching job was with the Daughters of Charity in Manila, where two of my siblings would pursue their nursing degrees. Working with the Daughters of Charity imbibed in my mind their charism to honor our Lord Jesus Christ as source and model of all charity, serving him corporally and spiritually in the persons of the poor. St. Vincent de Marillac, St. Vincent de Paul, St. Louis de Marillac, St. Catherine Labore, names that may sound familiar to you, I bet. Now, during this time, some of the family had opportunity to come to the United States, including my dad and mom. Meanwhile, back home, I had been suffering from the discomforts of sinus problems. I had most difficulty breathing and most often times spent sleepless nights waking up miserable in the mornings. Whatever discomforts I had, I was reminded to offer them up to Jesus, but prayed for healing as well. How will this come about? I had no idea. January 1st, 1980. While home for the holidays, I was invited to a luncheon at a family friend's house. There, I met again this woman who had been witnessing to me about Jesus and the Holy Spirit, speaking of them as if she knew them personally. I thought I knew everything about my faith, for I had mastered the Baltimore Catechism at the age of 12 as the school's representative to the first Catholic school competition in religion, and won it. <laughs> I thought I knew Jesus and the Holy Spirit well enough. Looks like it's all in my head. I must say, I was impressed with the experiential knowledge of this simple, so ordinary woman of God. When she spoke of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, especially on healing, I asked if she could pray for me. She remained quiet for a while, after which she told me, The Lord will heal you. Upon hearing these words, I believed without any shadow of doubt that I will be healed. There was that strong assurance in my heart that God will heal me. As soon as she laid hands on me, I felt suddenly that all my sinus cavities instantaneously cleared up, breathing freely once again, all the discomforts gone. That was the first time in many years I slept through the night with no discomfort at all. Woke up the next morning, so refreshed, so full of life, full of joy. It was just like a new breath of life. Thank you, Jesus. A year after that miraculous healing, I attended a weekend retreat now known as the Life in the Spirit Seminar. That weekend, I heard the basic gospel message proclaimed and witnessed in power, that God loves us, that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead to give us new life. God offers us a relationship in which we can have new life, a life lived in the presence and action of the Holy Spirit. What was required is that we open to the work of the Holy Spirit and that we turn our lives over to Jesus. On that weekend, by the grace of God, I came to realize that though Jesus has always been a part of my life, he was not really the center, nor was he the Lord. I was still in control, in charge, planning, doing things my way, 
asking him to confirm and bless my good plans. <laughs> no wonder nothing was working the way I wanted it. Realizing this, I deeply repented and desired that the power of the Holy Spirit be reactivated in my life once again. January 3rd, 1981, in front of the Blessed Sacrament, I, among many others, took to heart every word of that commitment prayer, offering my life to Jesus, promising to obey him as Lord, and ask him to baptize me in the Holy Spirit. It's a prayer for a full release of the power of the Holy Spirit received in baptism and confirmation. I believe I had a personal encounter with the Lord that night. Overwhelmed with God's love, I desired people around me to experience the same thing. The best that I could do was to hug and tell each person that God loves you. This was unusual of me. Have not done anything like this before. Can you just imagine the surprise, the stares in people's eyes of unbelief probably? I think I can understand what it is to be a fool for Christ. To shout from the rooftops for the world to hear, God loves you. Back from the retreat, friends especially, noticed some changes in me as one full of life, full of joy, more open, more communicative. What's the secret? Are you in love? <laughs> Have you finally found the man of your dreams? Mr. Wright? Yes, I have. <laughs> Who is he? Who is this lucky guy? Do we know him? Yes, you do. <laughs> Who is he? Now, this one quiet lady shared. I have come to realize that all these years, this man from Galilee had been giving me special attention, loving me all the time, patiently waiting for me, but have not even taken notice of him, nor was even aware of him. Not until this past weekend, when I came to realize how much he loves me, knew me even before I was formed in my mother's womb, consecrated me, set me apart for his purposes. For he says, for I know full well the plans I have for you. Not for woe, but a future full of hope. How can I not respond to the love of this man from Galilee, Jesus of Nazareth, who came down from heaven to earth to give me life, the very life of God, which we all have received in baptism confirmed by the Holy Spirit? How can I not love him in return, who proved his love for me? While we were still sinners, he died for us. Knowing that I am so loved no matter what, in whatever circumstances I find myself, just moves my heart. Yes, it is only by the power of his love that can draw me out of myself and draw me closer to him to that divine intimacy. I like to read love stories, romantic fictions, but lost all interest when I began reading sacred scriptures, the word of God. To me, it remains to be the greatest love story ever told. God's pursuing unrelentless love of God who so loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him may not perish, but might have eternal life. Life that begins here and now and spills over to eternity. Recalling all these wonderful memories of home and the events of the last few months, I just wondered, what would life be in this new country, America, which I shall now call home, and yet so unfamiliar in so many ways. I'm leaving the Philippines, so blessed with the initial experience of a fuller release of the power of the Holy Spirit. 
a renewed life in the spirit that has just begun but needs to grow. Taking with me only a few personal belongings, which included a Bible and a copy of the Imitation of Christ. Wondering what the future holds, I can only trust God that all will be well. I was interrupted from these recollections when the announcement asking all passengers to return to prepare for landing. In a few minutes, I will be on American soil, first landing Chicago O'Hare Airport as my port of entry. After processing with emigration, I proceeded to my connecting flight to Atlanta, my final destination. Expecting a friend from Chicago, whom the family requested to help me out and keep me in case of the impending air controller strike, she was nowhere to be found. How can I get to my connecting flight? Everything seemed new to me, so unfamiliar. I don't even know where to get the right information. Then I remember what mom used to say, when you don't know, ask. <laughs> Practical advice. But who do I ask? These are all strangers. So finally, I asked a kind-looking woman who pointed me to the direction of the flight to Atlanta. Thanks be to God. Just a few minutes before the passengers were called on board, here comes the friend running, apologizing for the delay due to heavy traffic. Whew, my first encounter of the unfamiliar. <laughs> After such exhausting experience, I was happy and thankful to see the family right at the gate to welcome me. Dad and mom, my sister Nen, and my younger brother Francis, my brother-in-law Jim. That was June 21st, 1981, when I arrived in Atlanta, Georgia. That year was my first experience of many celebrations of holidays, of my first turkey dinner, <laughs> that Thanksgiving day, and my first Christmas. Holy Week 1982 was quite interesting. It was business as usual on Good Friday. Preparations for Easter was even underway. It was a shock to me, quite different from the way Holy Week I had been used to. I guess I have just to get used to it, but God would intervene. June of the same year, my sister and I have gone to the Monastery of Visitation in Snellville for the annual Novena of Masses for the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, a devotion dear to our family. It was also to be my first encounter with the nuns, which later would develop into a friendship as Mother Superior and the Sisters welcomes me for the annual Easter Tridom, which continues up to this day for almost 28 years. Thank you, sisters. <laughs> it was not until December 12, 1983, that I started my first job at Emory University's Medical Library, which would later become the Health Sciences Center Library, the place I would retire after almost 28 years of service. It was here where I met someone who would later introduce me to the prayer group at Corpus Christi, this someone and I would later become good friends. April 13, 1984 was a special night to remember, for it was my first charismatic prayer meeting, actually my first since I arrived in the United States. What differentiates charismatic prayer meeting from others is the element of praise and worship. And the charisms are the gifts of the Holy Spirit manifested in these gatherings. It was an awesome time of praise and worship to God, praying, singing in English, and at times in an unknown language known as the gift of tongues, which maybe you have heard this morning, just like what the apostles experienced on that day of Pentecost. One can experience the awesome presence of God, for God inhabits the praises of his people. I always choked to tears, deeply moved, by the scripture readings. It was as if Jesus, the Good Shepherd, was speaking to me personally with the assurance of his ever loving, abiding presence. I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
He desires only that I put all my trust in him completely. Trust the Lord with all your heart and rely not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he will direct your path. April 30, 1984 was the beginning of many years of coming to the servants of the Lord Monday night prayer meeting. Serving the prayer room ministry with Anne Moorhead, may she rest in peace. Working with the team in presenting life in the spirit seminars. And later said yes when discerned and called to leadership in the prayer group. After some time, I was discerned and invited to serve as advisory member to the National Service Committee. Like the prophet Jeremiah, I was reasoning out, I'm too young, don't know that much. How can I feel in the shoes of this man of God who had served our prayer group leader and served the NSC, now due to illness, had to step aside? Now the following words of scripture seem to shed light. God chose the foolish of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak of this world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly and despised of this world, those who count for nothing, so that no human being might boast before God. Whoever boasts should boast in the Lord. Seeking to do God's will, I said yes to serve the National Service Committee for a term of two years. It must be in the late 80s when I was at church downtown for the wedding rehearsal of a friend. While waiting, I was drawn to this huge work of art, La Piera, depicting the Virgin Mary cuddling the dead body of Jesus. I had never seen the Piera before, so I looked intently, admiring this huge work of art in front of me, when suddenly a mental image flashed of an incident that happened years ago while I was still in the Philippines, where I was holding a boy in my arms with blood on his head. I immediately called for the school nurse after which the boy was taken away by the ambulance. Oh Lord, I'm so sorry. Had I listened and acted upon those repeated promptings at once to go out, instead of waiting to finish my work, that would have not happened. I pray nothing serious happened to this boy. Please, Lord, make him well, was my fervent prayer. When that incident happened, I was not even baptized in the Holy Spirit, nor was I familiar with the ways of the Holy Spirit. So I failed to respond to the repeated urgings or promptings to go out. So when I finally did, I heard loud commotion at the end of the hall with small boys crowding on something. When I came to see for myself what it was, there I laid on the ground a boy with blood coming from the head. It was found out that while playing, this boy was pushed around, lost balance, and fell to the ground. Without telling anybody except the Lord, I held myself responsible for this incident, for not having responded to the prompting of the Holy Spirit right there and then. Every now and then, I would check with the teacher with regard to the boy. It was such a relief when one day the boy showed up in class, alive and well. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed Cardinal Henry Newman made an important observation. The presence of the Lord is not discerned when it is upon us, but afterwards when we look back upon which is over and gone. Reflecting on this experience, taught me the valuable lesson of being attentive, sensitive, listening to the movement and promptings of the Holy Spirit. This would also help me grow in the area of discernment. Inspired by Eucharistic ministers to bring communion to the sick and homebound, I decided to be one. After going to training, I bought myself a fix, a container for the Eucharist, 
had it blessed, put it next to my pillow, so I'm reminded every night to pray for the person whom the Lord will send me. It was not until a year later when the university campus minister recommended someone diagnosed with leukemia. She was brought to the hospital for regular chemotherapy treatment, usually by friends, schoolmates, on a rotation basis, since she doesn't have family living in this country. She was a foreign graduate student pursuing a doctorate degree in the University of Athens. Over time, we became good friends. She began to openly share her life, that in her desire for higher learning, studying while working in between to augment her monthly allowance, she had neglected her health. She had not been to church and to the sacraments for years. Now, with her health failing, she felt miserable. As I continued to bring her Holy Communion, I began to see some changes. She was more peaceful. In one of my visits, she told me of the dream she had of Jesus, looking at her lovingly and saying, Count your blessings. Truly, she had been blessed, for she came to realize that her illness was a blessing in disguise, because she would have gone further astray had God not intervened. One day, I came to bring her a rose. Presley picked from the Rose Garden in Corpus Christi. As I entered the room, she was wide-eyed in amazement. Could not believe that Saint Therese would answer her prayer so soon as she has just finished her novena, asking for a sign to be held. It could be impossible for anyone to bring her flowers, for visitors were prohibited from doing so because it affects her breathing. But I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Later, she came to realize that really God did answer her prayer in a different way. Towards the end of her life, she forgave the person who hurt her most, and she received forgiveness as well. My last time to see her was at the hospital, asleep with a single tear in her eye, which I collected without knowing that 10 days later, she would pass on to the next life. I need not be around when she died, for she was no longer afraid of dying. She even called death Sister Death. She was free to meet her Maker, whom she had come to know and love later in life. When asked to give a eulogy, I spoke of the love and mercy of God of God's unrelenting pursuing love to this beloved. I also thank God for gracing me to witness his saving power and love. Nothing is too late nor lost in the Lord. Truly, he desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. When I look at the sky that day she died, it was a different blue sky I used to see. I just wondered if this was the blue sky of that so beautiful place she used to describe, which was out of this world. I just wondered. It is said that every Christian has two native lands, the land of his birth and the holy land, the cradle of Christianity, the land Jesus chose to be born and to live his life. Ever since I first heard from our grade school religion teacher of God who became man and lived here on earth. That to me is mind woggling, mind boggling. Imagine God becoming man and living here on earth. I would not go there. And that's just a young child, you know, it was, but I didn't tell it to anybody, you know, as a child, you know, you just keep it for yourself. I had a secret desire that someday I would be able to go and visit this place in Israel to take a faith journey into that site that Jesus made holy. In November 1992, thousands of pilgrims joined the four-member fire team for the first fire in Jerusalem rally, Catholic evangelistic events for adults. In the evening, we would listen to inspiring, powerful talks by Ralph Martin on faith, Sister Anne Shields on intercession, 
Father Mike Scanlon on repentance, and Father John Bertolucci on evangelization. At daytime, it was a great privilege to be present at the sacred spot and listen to the reading of the gospel connected to it. To kneel at the Basilica of the Nativity, Bethlehem, where the silver star denotes the spot where Jesus is thought to have been born with the inscription, Jesus was here, Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. Nazareth, where Jesus grew up into manhood, lived 30 years of his life with Joseph and Mary, working at Joseph's carpentry shop. Capernaum, a fishing village on the shore of Sea of Galilee, the town reported to have been the home of Jesus during his public ministry, where he would stay at St. Peter's house. The Via Dolorosa, leading to Mount Calvary, where Jesus suffered and died, and the empty tomb where Jesus was buried, but rose from the dead on the third day according to the scriptures. The upper room where Jesus and disciples ate their last Passover meal, instituted the Holy Eucharist and the priesthood. And the same upper room where 50 days later, the Holy Spirit descended upon Mary and the disciples on that day of Pentecost. Something significant happened while we were there at the upper room. While after listening to the Pentecost narrative, everybody in that group spontaneously prayed in tongues to the amazement of the people in the area. Just what happened that day of Pentecost? What does this mean? They have had too much wine. It, but it was only 9 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> The Holy Land experience gave me a deeper appreciation and gratitude for all that Jesus did for me to give me new life. It changed the way I see the Bible, that Jesus is the living word of God, and like Mary, we are called to embrace his word. Ponder on it, pray, act, and live out God's word, responding to a renewed call to discipleship by walking the footsteps of Jesus. If you want to be my disciple, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Words when lived out is not easy, but difficult. When applied to a particular situation where I had difficulty working with someone at work, it came to a point that after several arguments, we are no longer speaking to each other. Realizing I have offended her and God, I repented of my wrongful attitudes and actions and sought ways to be reconciled with her, but to no avail, for she refused any means of reconciliation whatsoever. What do I do? I cried to the Lord. This I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. For if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? And if you do good to those only who do you good, what credit is that to you? But rather, love your enemies and do good to them. Then your reward will be great, and you will be called children of the Most High, for he himself is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. With these words, I ask the Lord to give me the grace to do what He commanded me to do, just as what my confessor advised me to do. With deep sorrow in my heart, I offered the entire situation to the Lord, especially at Mass and at every Eucharistic adoration, praying for her, doing good even when ignored and rejected. Little by little, my attitudes changed when I came to realize that this child of God had had an unhappy childhood, a failed marriage, living by herself alone, separated from family, continued to have relationship problems. One time, I sensed the Lord saying, if something happens to her and she needs help, will you be there for her? Immediately, I said yes, which I really meant. In that moment of grace, I knew I was healed. One day, while working on my computer, I could sense that someone was behind me, and when a hand reached out with a piece of candy, I turned around to see who it was. It was her, this child of God, 
whom I had been waiting for years. It's not one year, it's just almost 10 years to be reconciled. Immediately, I stood up and hugged her. This to me was a sign of reconciliation. This was the beginning of the new relationship that we, where we would become good friends. From then on, she would hand me scripture verses, her favorites. One day, I received in the mail a beautiful picture card from her which shows two cute little girls dressed in white, wearing bonnets, both standing side by side with hands clasped together, both faces lifted towards the sun, standing before a beautiful white fence garden. That picture card spoke volumes to me. As it is truly said, one picture is worth a thousand words. When asked by someone where I would go next after Holy Holy Land, I answered Rome. <laughs> the following year, in September of 1993, I was with a group of renewal leaders from the United States that joined many others worldwide for the first international Catholic Charismatic Renewal Retreat in Assisi. Gathered under the Tent of Unity on top of Rocca Maggiore, a fortress in Assisi. The theme of that gathering, renewed by listening to the Spirit, with Father Raniero Cantalamesa, preacher of the papal household as our retreat master. One of the prophetic words given was Ezekiel's vision of the valley of the dry bones. I guess you're aware of that. If you want to look at it, it's 37. Which I believe is the word for us today in our time. While in Assisi, before going out to the tent meeting, I would stop by the Basilica of St. Clair and prayed the same prayers St. Francis did before the crucifix in San Damiano. After which, Francis heard the Lord say, Francis, go rebuild my church, which as you see, lies in ruins. Do you think we have the message that in our time today? The retreat culminated with a general audience with our Holy Father, Pope John Paul II at that time, in his summer residence in Gastel Gandolfo, who is an enthusiastic supporter of the Catholic Charismatic Renewal, when he said, I am convinced that this movement is a sign of the Spirit's action, a very important component in the total renewal of the Church. Before leaving for the United States with my roommate and I stayed in Rome for two more days, my first at, the, at St. Peter's Basilica, where I was captivated by this huge stained glass window of the Holy Spirit dove symbol. I guess some of you must have seen that. Which to me looked so real and alive as the bright sun shone through it. Especially that part of the Mass, there was a Mass going on at that time, where the celebrant prayed to God to send down the Holy Spirit to change the bread and wine into the body and blood of His Son. Truly, it is the Spirit that gives life, for He is the Lord and giver of life. What a grace-filled experience this all were. My two-year term of service to the National Service Committee was ending in 1994, which I did not renew, for I was to discern the call to religious vocation. It was a challenge I took among many others at a national conference where Bishop Sam Jacobs asked us for a year to stay in prayerful discernment, to make a vocation retreat, and have a spiritual director. Except for work, I cut down all my other activities. My spiritual director was helpful during this process with his wisdom and guidance. Around the same time, my spiritual director became seriously ill and a year later died. After a year of vocation discernment with no positive results, I left it there in God's hands, trusting in Him, relying not on my own understanding, and moved on. There is a custom which I don't know if it still continues to this day, 
of having a patron saint chosen for a year as a special friend and protector or guardian or as an intercessor for one's needs and material, material and spiritual as well. I know that Jesus is my patron saint, for I was named after him, Jesus, who is Emmanuel. I asked Jesus then what particular aspect or title of him he wanted me to focus on that year. The answer came, Jesus, the most blessed Eucharist. It came when I was lifting through the pages of the diary of Sister Faustina, where it read, Patron of the Year 1935, the Most Blessed Eucharist. There and then, I knew that Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament was to be my patron saint that year of 1996. So I concentrated my studies and readings on the Blessed Sacrament, spending more time in Eucharistic adoration. Not too long after that, I met someone who would be instrumental in getting me trained for the Life in the Eucharist Seminar program, sponsored by the Archdiocese of Atlanta in conjunction with Eucharistic renewal called forth by Archbishop John Donahue in 1994. After months of intensive training, four teams were commissioned to present Life in the Eucharist Seminar in Paris throughout the Archdiocese so that the Paris communities may come to a deeper understanding and appreciation of the Eucharistic mysteries and develop a personal and intimate relationship with Jesus, who is truly present in the Eucharist. For your information, the Life in the Eucharist seminar continues to be given up to this day. So you just have to ask from the Archdiocese. About a year after my first encounter of bringing Holy Communion to the sick, I started bringing communion to someone who had a stroke. That Sunday, I was asked by a member of the family if I can pray for her aunt. When I asked the aunt what he wants Jesus to do for her, she said she wants to be freed from nightmares which she had since she was a teenager. She continued to say that she had been wanting to ask me to pray for her, but didn't have the courage until that day. As I sat and listened, the gospel reading that particular Sunday came to mind. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. Inspired by God's word, we claim the words of Jesus sent to proclaim liberty to captives and to set the oppressed go free. After some time of prayer, she said, I felt so lighthearted as if a big chunk of happiness was lifted from me. Thank you, Jesus. We both cried with joy. The next day, I got a call from her. Emanuela, I didn't have any bad dreams last night. Praise you, Jesus. She was in her 70s when that happened. Today, in her 90s, she continued to praise and thank God for all that the Lord has done for her. See the love and compassion of Jesus. May 2004 was a sad time. We lost the fourth sibling in the family to brain aneurysm. She was a mother of three boys. Her youngest, of whom she had a difficult pregnancy, was only eight years old when she died. My parents' strong faith in God helped ease the pain as we grieved together the loss of our beloved. We shall remember her unwavering faith in God for the sacrificial love she had for her family in spite of unhappy and difficult marriage. Of the time she volunteered as CCD, just so she can help prepare her son for his first Holy Communion without knowing that it would be her last few months. Why would she have to die on my birthday? Asked one of my siblings. There was a long silence. No one has the answer. Only God knows. In God we trust. 2008 graduation days. Happy days as we celebrated the achievements of nephews and a niece graduating from college with academic degrees. We saw the pride and joy of dad and mom over the grandchildren's achievements. 
reminiscent of us eight children when we graduate from college, not knowing that after this month of celebration, we would enter to a most sorrowful time in our lives. September 2008 was the most difficult time as we grappled with mom's illness. Mom never smoked, kept herself healthy, made regular visits to the doctor's office when suddenly she fell ill. And after a battery of tests, she was diagnosed with lung cancer. She never recovered and we lost mom two months after diagnosis. Six weeks after we buried mom, we buried dad. He was equally health conscious, made regular visits for checkups, and was a picture of health. Dad suffered a heart attack, causing arterial blockage in his heart, necessitating a coronary bypass surgery. Recovery was not to be for dad. For a few days after heart surgery, he had a cardiac arrest, and a few days later, passed away. The shock of the loss of both parents was overwhelming. Weeks, months, and years were not easy. As individually and as a family dealt with our loss and pain of extreme sadness, heartache, emptiness, and other multitude of strong emotions. One wrote, Be open to the pain of your broken heart. God enters its brokenness. Taking one day at a time approach was helpful as I allowed myself to grieve at my own pace. While respecting each one's way of grieving and timetable, God is a healer as he continues to heal us. We still grieve, but with hope. Believing that our loved ones will always be with us in memory and in prayer. For the love between us and our loved ones is a spiritual bond that death cannot sever. For really and truly, nothing can separate us from the love of God with the death of our loved ones. We grieve, but we find comfort in believing that we have our loved ones in eternity who are interceding for us. The cherished memories of our parents, of the many years of sacrificial love of raising eight children, providing us with the best of Catholic Christian education, sharing our joys and sorrows, our struggles and triumphs, praying for each one of us and our prayer needs, encouraging sharing us their great wisdom learned from life's lessons and experiences, the legacy of faith nurtured by grace, witnessed by their unwavering faith in God and unconditional love for us. These are the memories we hold dear in our hearts. Truly, God has blessed us, and we shall be forever grateful for the gift of dad and mom. God's love personified and experience. God is real and alive in the loving support of brothers and sisters and the faith community as well. In September 2010, my brother Francis and I, accompanied by a relative of mom, left for the Philippines to visit my mother's hometown, where she was born, grew up, met and married dad. Because of raising a big family, and money was tight. My parents had not had the opportunity to visit when they left when I was only two years old. For me, it was also an opportunity to visit my birthplace. My mom was the only child, and so we were thankful for surviving relatives who gave us accounts and toured us around to the church where we had mass and procession on the feast of St. Michael the Archangel the town's patron saint, met with relatives, classmates, and friends of dad and mom, whom we met for the first time, and also visits to, to places of interest. 
It was so moving. As I stood on the ground where God gave me life, with only a mango tree as landmark, and recapture the events surrounding that first day of January 64 years ago. Based on the accounts of relatives, the house was not far from a big river. Now, the river is gone. Instead, there was a stream along the mango tree, the only tree to survive among the fruit trees planted by my great-grandmother. A year after our visit, and actually that was last year, 2011, a strong storm hit the region and the neighboring towns. The old mango tree was not spared, for it fell to the ground, causing a relative to comment, the mango tree just waited for your visit. <laughs> there will always be a memory of that mango tree, of that landmark where I was born. For we were told that three coffee tables were made from the wood of that mango tree. <laughs> So there will always be a memory, right? <laughs> to complete the trip before we turned to the United States, my brother and I visited the hometown where we all grew up. There to visit the gravesite of our maternal grandmother. This is the grandmother that brought that breathed life on me. And you can take the pic you can come forward and see the picture of this grandmother here. Since mom was her only daughter, she lived with us, helping take care of eight grandchildren. So my parents can live, can earn a living to raise the family. God took her to her eternal reward in 1997, the day before the feast of Saint Anthony, her patron saint. She's always wearing brown, by the way. <laughs> it was such a long journey, but it was all worth it. On the occasion of my parents' 60 people wedding anniversary celebration, 17 days before mom died, Dad spoke of the path one must take until one reached the goal as we journey to God. I believe Dad was referring to the journey of faith which we as a family have journeyed together. Now that our parents have completed the journey, run the race, kept the faith, we in turn are to continue to run with perseverance the race that God set before us. I do not claim to be perfect, nor do claim to have arrived. In fact, I have a long way to go. So continually I ask God the graces I need to stay close to Jesus, to fix my eyes on Him, to run the race, to keep the faith until He calls me home. The cloud of witnesses so I spoken of in Hebrews 12 stand as a constant reminder that all things are possible with Jesus. It shows us what can happen when we take God at His word and His promises and allow Him to work in and through us. In this journey of faith, I have learned to dispose myself to be open to receive all that God in His goodness has already bestowed on us. A reminder of us is in Ephesians, the first chapter of Ephesians. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has bestowed on us in Christ Jesus every spiritual blessings in the heavens. We need to remind ourselves that whatever we might need has already been gifted to us because of God's love and goodness, that the Holy Spirit is given to discover and appreciate what God has given us in Christ Jesus. I have chosen Mary, the mother of God, taken her as my spiritual mother, a woman of great faith who trusted that the Lord's word to her would be fulfilled. A model of faithful discipleship who always yes to the will of the Father, immaculate and spouse of the Holy Spirit, always faithful despite all sorts of hardship, obstacles, and sufferings. How true it is that God desires to give us more. I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. This year of faith, declared by Pope Benedict XVI, is an opportunity for us Catholics to experience a conversion, to turn back to Jesus and enter a deeper relationship with Him. And that's not my word, that's the word of the Holy Father in that door of faith. I believe that many of us here present 
including myself, do bear witness to the transforming power that comes from a personal relationship with Jesus and from the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Fruits of transformed lives shown in different ministries that are serving the church, the people of God. Here we are right here as the service team of the Atlanta Joyful Visitation Chapter of Magnificat. And all of the men of you had been serving God in different ministries. That's the fruit of a transformed life. So let us embrace with great confidence the life to which God has called each one of us. In Jesus, he has created each one of us for something special. May we all come to discover our calling and eagerly run the race that is before us. May we one day join the cloud of witnesses and glorify God who has loved us from all eternity. Now to him who is able to do so much more than we can even ask or imagine according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in his church, in Christ Jesus, through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. I would just like to end with this prayer because this has been my prayer since I had been baptized. And this is really, my soul proclaims the greatness of your love, O Lord my God. My spirit rejoices in you, my Savior. For you have looked with pity, with mercy on this unworthy servant. Truly, I had been richly blessed. For you, the Almighty, has done great things for me. Holy is your name. Amen. I really can't top that. <laughs> there is just nothing more to say, is there? I don't know about you, but I've got a lot to think about. I, I have been challenged, praise God. And um. I hope you have too. I think we're off to a good start on the year of faith. I thank you for joining us this morning. God bless you. Thank you.